I invite you to stand now for the reading of the gospel. Hear the good news from the gospel of Luke, the 23rd chapter, beginning with the 50th verse. Now there was a good and righteous man named Joseph, who though a member of the council, had not agreed to their plan and action. He came from the Jewish town of Arimathea, and he was waiting expectantly for the kingdom of God. This man went to Pilate and asked for the body of Jesus. Then he took it down, wrapped it in a linen cloth, and laid it in a rock-hewn tomb where no one had ever been laid. It was the day of preparation, and the Sabbath was beginning. The women who had come with him from Galilee followed, and they saw the tomb and how his body was laid. Then they returned and prepared spices and ointments. On the Sabbath, they rested according to the commandment. This is the word of God for us, the people of God. Thanks be to God. May we pray. Father, we thank you for this day and for this time that you give us to be in worship with each other. We are grateful for the opportunity to support one another in the work to which you have called us. And so now, God, we ask that you will allow the ministry of your spirit to open our ears and our hearts that we might hear you once again. Speak in a way that is clear. Speak in a way that encourages. Speak in a way that replenishes and, yes, even revives. May your will be done in this moment. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. I am, uh, I come in the name that has power for us all the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. I, uh, I am thankful for the friendship and fellowship of James Howell, now well over 20 years. It is something for ministers to have friendships that long and that lasting. And I am so grateful for the ways in which he has been a blessing to me and to my family. It's good to see Superintendent Box here today. We shared in ministry when he was the pastor at Sharon United Methodist Church and the work of helping empower local people. I am honored by this invitation to share with you on today. I'm grateful that my wife, Kim, and some of our staff are here as well. The New Living Translation of the Scriptures, beginning with verse 55, reads this way, As his body was taken away, the women from Galilee followed and saw the tomb where his body was placed. Then they went home and prepared spices and ointments to anoint his body. But by the time they were finished, the Sabbath had begun. So they rested as required by the law. They rested. Join me in uh, giving thanks for this, this singing aggregation. Can we praise God for them? For the musicians. I've been blessed by your ministry today. Good music is a blessing. Bad music is a curse. <laughs> and we were blessed by you, by you today. I am honored to share with you as a yoke fellow in the service of our Lord. And I want to thank you for the work that you do to the glory of our God and to manifest his reach and reign upon the earth. 
I want to acknowledge and applaud you for your dedication to God, how you and your families give of yourselves in ways that only heaven knows and people often don't appreciate. I want to commend you for the restraint that you exercise in moments and instances where it would be easy to say or do something. But for the sake of Christ, you hold your peace, you bite your tongue, you maintain your composure. I salute you for the commitment and passion that you display in preaching and teaching and counseling and caring and planning and programming such that people might have a transformative experience with God. Having been involved in pastoral ministry for now over 28 years and in the preaching ministry for over 35, I'm well aware of the stresses and strains that you face on a daily basis. The pursuit of God's call and claim is one of great weight. And the only way that it is carried out is through a love of and for our Lord. And therefore, I want to honor you for the love that you have for the Lord. In thinking about you and what might be a word from the Lord to all of us, I was drawn by another group of people who serve the Lord out of a deep love for him. Luke identifies them as the women from Galilee. Matthew identifies three of them being Mary Magdalene, Mary the mother of James and Joseph, and Salome the mother of James and John. Mark 15, 41, Mark tells us that whenever Jesus was in Galilee, they would follow him and help him. Each of them had a deep love for our Lord in their hearts, and they genuinely loved and appreciated him. The extent of their commitment to him was demonstrated by their being with him at his crucifixion, and their desiring to attend to his body for burial. Having walked with him in life, they stood with him in death. They watched him give his life for them. They saw him breathe his last breath. And no doubt with that last breath, their breath was taken away. You can imagine the grief, the sorrow, the despair that they must have felt at the sight of his beaten and bloodied and now lifeless body being taken down off the cross. Joseph of Arimathea wraps it in fine linen and places it in a tomb cut in the rock which he owned. These women watch from a distance. As Jesus' body is buried in the tomb, their hope for the consolation of Israel is also buried. Burdened, grieved, and discouraged, they return home with one more mission for Jesus in mind. They must anoint his body for burial. They prepare the spices and perfume necessary for burial. This would be their final act of love. This would be their concluding offering of worship. Verse 56 reads, Then they went home and prepared spices and ointments to anoint his body. But by the time they were finished, the Sabbath had begun. So they rested as required by the law. With their last task remaining unfinished, they rested. While they possessed everything that they needed to conclude the mission, they rested. While their feelings were yet raw, passions yet deep, adrenaline yet high, they rested. No doubt their love for Jesus could not bear the thought of Jesus laying in a tomb without having been properly prepared. Nevertheless, they rested. I'm struck by these words, they rested, because I wonder how often that can be said of me and of us. 
We who love the Lord, who have given our lives to the call and claim of the kingdom of God, how often would a writer pen those words of us, they rested? With ministry yet outstanding, with sermons yet to preach, lessons yet to teach, people yet to counsel, sick yet to visit, boards yet to lead, budgets yet to raise and meet, with expectations yet to satisfy. How often is that said of us they rested? Having been raised under the influence of the Protestant work ethic where industriousness was held as a spiritual virtue and stillness was akin to laziness. Very few were known as those who rested. I was raised that you don't stop until the work is finished. The problem with that is that the work of ministry is never finished. There is always something left to do, isn't there? There is a person who hasn't yet been visited, a letter that hasn't yet been written, a call that has not been made, an appointment that has not been kept, a dispute that has not been settled, a problem that has not been solved. And therefore, operating under the premise that you don't stop until the work is finished and the work of ministry never being finished, you very rarely are prone to stop working. And yet, with the work for Jesus being undone, they rested. They rested because their lives were governed by a Sabbath rhythm. They understood the Sabbath to be a requirement from God. They also learned from Jesus that the Sabbath was made for them, therefore they rested. It's hard to have a healthy view of rest when you have an unhealthy view of worth and work. The matter of resting, of taking Sabbath, is about the proper calibration between being and doing, and uh, the understanding of both should be grounded in our theology. God's essential state is being. God is revealed in terms of being first. Doing comes out of God's being. God was and then God created and then God rested from creating. When I look at this, the question arises, why does an eternal, inexhaustible, and omnipotent God rest? It's not that God grew tired, faint, or weary. It's not that God needed to be replenished. We often say, well, it was to give us the example of what we should do. Yes, that, that is what God does when God rests. But why does God rest? Obviously, it's not out of need. And if it is not out of need, then why does our God rest? Could it simply be that God rests because God chooses to do so as an expression of God's worth. Could God's resting simply be a matter of God saying, I am worthy of resting? Could it be that just as God's creating reveals who God is, so does God's resting reveal who God is? God is the God who does not need to do anything to be who God is. God is just God, period. And God's resting is an assertion of God's worth and value. God could stop doing because God was comfortable with just being. Because God was who God was long before God ever did anything. And God stopping from doing did not change who God was because God was all that God was before God ever did one thing. This is important, is it not? Because we are prone not to take the rest that we should because we equate resting with responding to a lack of energy or deficiency. But God's rest was not out of deficiency. It was a decision that God made in the fullness of God's being, out of the fullness of God. God simply chose to rest because God was worth resting. And having created us in the image and likeness of God's self, God sets forth the Sabbath, this matter of living by a rhythm of 
being and doing, serving and resting as a means of asserting and establishing and being reminded of our essential worth and value. We are not because we do. We are simply because we are. Our value is in our being. We are human beings, not human doings. And yet, how often is it the case when someone asks, how are you? We immediately talk about what we do. We are human beings. We are as much who we are when we rest as we are who we are when we preach, teach, counsel, sing, direct, or play. Who are you when you do nothing? Do you feel as important? Do you feel as valued? Do you feel as necessary when you are resting as you do when you are serving? With all that claimed their attention, with everything that pulled upon their hearts, these women rested. And their resting was not an indication of a lessening of love for the Lord or a diminishing of their commitment to the Lord. It was not an abdication of their responsibility. They rested because it was required. It was out of obedience to the Lord. It was required that they rest. They were called to a time of rest. The Sabbath put them on a fast from activity. As heartfelt as their activity was, they were called to a fast. Do you see rest as your calling? Do you see taking time to step off the merry-go-round of service as a calling from God? Might God be saying to you, this Lent, eat all that you want to eat, but stop doing some things and take a rest? In October of 2011, I received news from my one and, un and only brother of 38 years of age, the words that no one ever wants to hear, I have cancer. He was diagnosed with squamous cell cancer of the tongue. It was said that with that type of cancer, the surgery and the follow-up chemo, there was a 75% survival rate. In November, I was with my brother during and after his surgery, and he recovered during that month and shared with us over the Christmas and New Year holidays, and he looked well. Nothing about him would say that there was anything terminal to him. He began the requisite treatments in February of 2012, and in March of that year, he began to experience a high fever that the doctors took to be simply due to infection, which they treated with antibiotics. Because my brother was single, I would go back and forth to New York every other week. And in April, he was hospitalized. And then they discovered what they thought was infection fever was actually tumor fever. The cancer had spread. And my brother died on May 5th, 2012. In a matter of seven months from diagnosis, my brother died. And that was and remains the most painful experience of my life. It served as a door that opened up every other unresolved grief and pain that I had. And the only way that I could describe it, its impact, was that I was a constantly shrinking dot with everything growing larger and larger around me. All through that time, I maintained my pastoral duties. I preached every Sunday, but I knew that I needed rest. I needed to stop. And while there was so much depending upon my active involvement, campuses and staffs and budgets, if I did not stop, there would be no more me to offer. I was offering a diminished me. I was giving all of me, but the all of me that I was giving was at 75%. How much of you is here today? Are you serving out of the you at 
Or is it the you at 80? Is it the you at 50? While God faints not nor grows weary, God knows that we are flesh and that we do grow faint. We do grow weary. We do wear out. And as much of anointing as we may think or the congregation may believe, we do break down. And God sets the rhythm of rest for our strength to be renewed. Now these women would have continued if the Sabbath had not come. They would have persisted in their weariness and in their grief. But the Sabbath called for a fast of activity so that they could begin to absorb their grief. Their rest gave some interior space for God to begin God's work of recovery. No doubt they cried. No doubt they questioned. No doubt they pondered. No doubt they slept. All of which was necessary for recovery, for their return to wholeness. One of the things that I've learned is that we confuse resiliency with recovery. We are those who persevere, are we not? We are those who press through, do we not? But just because you press through something doesn't mean that you're over something. It is only when we stop doing, it is only when we are at rest that God has the space to do the work necessary for true recovery. It's in the pause, is it not, that God is able to surface the hidden, to address what's been outstanding, to calm what's been troubling, to soothe what's been hurting, to assuage what's been angering. It's in the pause. It's in the rest. As we listened to the music being played and sung, was not the power in the pause? Was it not in the rest? They rested. They realized that the unfinished work would still be there after the Sabbath. I mean, after all, where was Jesus' body going to go? <laughs> it was lifeless. It was limp. It was placed in the tomb. They watched him breathe his last breath. They beheld Joseph of Arimathea put him in the tomb and now the word is that soldiers are guarding it and a stone is over it and the seal of Rome is affixed to the stone saying nobody will go out and nobody will come in. The work will still be there after they've rested. Here's the question, can you rest knowing that the work will still be there after you've rested? Can you pause knowing that as long as you have a box called inbox, there's always going to be something in it? And the inbox will still be there after you rest it. Can you take a break knowing that no amount of work that you do will ever satisfy everybody or will ever complete all that there is to do? God rested on the seventh day knowing that there was an eighth day coming after the seventh day. And God's resting would not make God late for anything because every day and all days are the same to God. Could God be calling someone to rest today knowing that whatever it is from which you disengage will be there when you return from resting? Could you hear God say, it's in God's hands. And that in resting, the sovereignty of God and our reliance upon God are acknowledged because, friends, there are some things that God can do with you not being around. When God calls the people to a fast from the land, God calls them away from the land. While their hand would be off the land, God's hand would remain on the land. While they would not work the land, there would be a work that God would do with the land. The land didn't disappear just because they rested from the land. 
God did a work without them with the land. And the same thing happens in our text. With the women resting, God does something inside the tomb. God does something with the body of Jesus. While the women are resting away from the tomb, God is working within the tomb. The first verses of the next chapter tell us very early Sunday morning, the women went to the tomb taking the spices they had prepared and they found that the stone had been rolled away from the entrance. So they went in, but they did not find the body of the Lord Jesus. Can you see them approaching the tomb rested and now ready to fulfill their final assignment? Can you hear them talking about the stone that would need to be rolled away? and wondering who will roll away the stone. And by the time that they arrived, their concern was addressed. The stone that they feared had been rolled away and the body that they were prepared to anoint was not there. And in place of the soldiers that they thought would intimidate them were angels postured to assure them, saying, you seek Jesus who was crucified. He is is not here he is risen just as he said remember what he told you back in Galilee that the son of man must be betrayed into the hands of sinful man and be crucified and he would rise again on the third day Jesus was resurrected and their assignment was transformed they came with the view of anointing a dead body but they leave having to announce a risen savior no need for spices no need for ointment all that they need is the power of their voice and the word of their testimony their rest prepared them for a transformed assignment it's announcing a risen savior it's spreading the good news that the Christ who died is the Christ who is risen and it is this risen Christ that says I will give my people rest through Jesus God has prepared a rest for his people and does he still not call out to you and to me come unto me all ye that labor and are heavy laden and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me for I am meek and lowly in heart and you will find rest for your souls for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. They rested. May it be said of us, we rested. Amen. My soul be still and do not fear The winds of change may rage tomorrow God is on your side No longer dread The fires of unexpected sorrow God, you are my God be shaken, Lord, a peace renew, the steadfast spirit within me to rest in you ways with shield of faith against 
Christ's temptations flaming arrows. God, you are my God, and I will trust in you and not be shaken. Lord, a peace renew of steadfast spirit within. My soul be still, do not forsake.